Sometimes that can be dangerous. As God began to show this to me this morning, I could see those children of Israel had been walking. They had already had a beaded path. Amen. If any farmers are here today and you got cattle, you can you can always go out in the field and you can see that one little path. Man, they get in line and here they go. And it ain't too long. The grass won't even grow there no more. These children of Israel had walked the same path for 40 years. And as the Bible says, and the cloud led them by day and a fire led them by night. But on this day, my God, I got goosebumps on goosebumps. But on this day, the cloud did something that it had not done for 40 years because they had been following the presence of the cloud of God. And on this day, the cloud always made a left turn. <laughs> but on this day, the cloud decided it was going to go this way. And when the cloud turned, the Bible says they walked into their promise that they had been looking for for 40 years. Somebody needs to hear the word of the Lord today and your promise is standing just on the other side of your decision that I'm going to turn Amen. And go a different direction for the rest of my life. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know, son, man, I don't know what you came here for today. But I come to tell you there is a man by the name of Jesus. And he came with healing. He came with deliverance. He came with joy. He came with peace. Hallelujah. To all our guests that are here today, welcome. Thank you for being here with us here at POC. We honor you. Thank you. Man, it looks good over here on my left side. To all of those that are here today, our guests, we honor you, sir, man. Thank you for being here. We didn't come here to entertain today. We didn't come here just to sing some pretty songs. But what we come here for today is to entertain the presence of the Almighty God. Today, somebody gets your divine chill. Let's give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
the answer. So whatever it is, I want you to lift your hand. And we're going to begin to sing this again. And whatever it is that you need today, whatever it is that you're facing, I want you to sing with us in Jesus' name. Because all things are possible through the name of Jesus. to heal their bodies. Pastor Anthony Mangan needs a healing. Brother James Corney needs a healing. From the strongholds of addictions that are gripping our community and are gripping our world. Lord, we need you more than ever today. Return of our prodigals. As we begin to pray, like I said, if you, if you need something in this house, if you need someone to lay hands on you, we are, we are more than prepared to do that today. And we would invite you to come right down here to this front. Lord, we pray for every situation, every need, the ones that we just listed. Lord, the ones that we don't even know about. God, I pray that your power and your anointing, God, would go where they're at. I pray that your healing, Lord Jesus, would go where they're at. And I pray, God, that you would touch every sickness, every situation. Lord, I pray that you would put it in divine order. And God, I pray that your power, Lord God, would fill every room, Lord God, that they're at. God, you would go, Lord, and a touch, Lord God, would come. Lord, as we speak. 
speak right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, every person that walks to this front, Lord, you know their situation, you know their problems, God, you know their needs. And God, I pray that you would meet with them today, Lord. You said when two or three are gathered and agree, Lord, there you will be. And God, we declare your word to be true today. We declare healing in this house today. In Jesus' name. service tomorrow night. Pre-service prayer is 6.30 p.m. Anybody excited? It's going to be a great day. We're going to carry it right into tomorrow night. Service will start at 7 p.m. Also, Wednesday night we'll have corporate prayer at 6.30 p.m. Service will start at 7 p.m. The youth will meet in the back at 6.30 p.m. Also, Friday, this Friday, January 22nd, the kickoff service for Rise Up Recovery. Is anybody excited? Anybody going to be here for that Friday night? Come on, is anybody excited? That's what a kickoff service is supposed to be. The excitement's going to be in the air. We're going to have a house full. It's going to be a great time. We'll have fellowship and refreshments at 6.30. Service will start at 7. Brother Near will be our guest speaker on Friday night. Also, next Sunday and Monday will be revival services again. Brother Ryan there will be with us 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, as well as next Monday night the 25th, pre-service prayer at 6.30, service starting at 7. Back to our Rise Up Recovery. If you haven't bought a t-shirt to support yet, I insist that you do that. Um, Sister Amanda would definitely appreciate the support. They're using this as a fundraiser, I believe to raise funds for the group. So if you haven't purchased a t-shirt yet or you haven't ordered one, please see Sister Amanda today, tomorrow, tomorrow night, and get you one ordered so that we can get the word out. T-shirt's the best way to get the word out. Everybody's everybody's always looking at your shirt, and uh, it'll have all that information on it. So do that um, to Sister Amanda ASAP. Offer, if you can stand to your feet, as we say every service, we thank you so much for giving not only your funds but your time being here but we thank you for giving your funds as well we have four ways that we can give the polc.church you can go and click the online giving link there you can text to give at 504-470-0970 you can mail it to 20155 Mill Plant Road, La Ronge, Louisiana 70446 or again as we say every week we would love for you to give in person uh, we thank you again for each and every one of us. If you could grab your offering, your tithe, your, your building fund, whatever it may be, and hold that in your hand as we pray a blessing over it this morning. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to give back to your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for what you have blessed us with. And God, we give it back to you this morning as we lay it upon your altar this morning. As we come and we put it in this basket. God, we pray that your anointing would bless it. God, you would bless the giver. Lord, and you would bless the, the offering that the giver is giving. Lord, we pray that you would anoint it. And God, your power and your spirit, Lord God, would go with it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. If you can march from the back to the front to give your tithing offering. And stay up to the front for a time of worship this morning. It feels great in the house today. I believe that God has a special touch for us today. I believe that God 
has a divine purpose for each one of us being here today. Do you believe that today? Do you believe it? God is going to touch us. God is going to be with us in Jesus' name.
all sing that from the front to the back. Come on, there's one big cry. Come on, this is just a declaration. It's a declaration of our faith. It's a declaration of the belief that we have the power of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's keep singing it just a few more times. you're real I want to know you and I want I want to meet you and experience you today is your day amen amen but I give honor to uh, pastor love your pastor your leadership that's here if there was ever a church that you you'll feel the love of God it's here amen even even this old ex-drug addict, ex-alcoholic, ex-whatever. I'm, I mean, I came in here and you loved me. Yeah. Amen. So I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful. 
for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, musicians and singers. And we're going to transition to the Word of God while our hearts are open, and we're going to we're going to watch God speak to us. Okay. This will be a divine shift. There's there's a power in a made up mind. There's power in a made up mind. But if you have your Bibles, I want you, while you're standing in reverence of the word, I'm going to take you to Joshua. Joshua chapter 22. Look at all the people that are here. This place is full. See, when the word gets out, what you going to do? Like it? See, when the place gets this full and people are just going to keep coming because God is moving and changing lives. And I'm glad that I'm the evangelist that I just travel different places every weekend and everything. And I leave the difficult decisions up to pastors and they got to figure out what they're going to do to accommodate all that God is doing. Amen. But Joshua chapter 22 is so good to be back in LaRondra. And uh, man, we're going to start at verse 1. We're going to have fun today. Amen. Amen. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I've commanded you. Ye have not left your brother in these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye and get you unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side. Jordan, somebody say the other side. <laughs> now skipping down to verses 26. The Bible says, therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold the pattern. Somebody say the pattern. <laughs> behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, or for sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God that is before His tabernacle. Now, skipping down to verse 34 just to kind of complete the context. And the children of Reuben... And the children of Gad called the altar. Ed. Ed. Now, I want you real quick, humor me and just look at your neighbor and say, Ed. Really? Out of all now, is there anybody in here that's named Ed? Is there an Ed? I saw you kind of looked at each other. Oh, okay, we got oh, okay. Edward, Edwick, education. I don't know. Is there 
Okay, okay. So, out of all the things you could have named your altar, I mean, all the Bible names, Jedediah, Jehovah Nisi, I mean, you could have named, but they named their altar Ed. For it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. This morning, if you'll help me, and by the help of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to preach to you about an altar called Ed. Amen? Amen. Now, if you're going to help me preach, I need you to first help me pray. So would you do it? Would you just ask God to help this poor man up here? Amen. Would you do it? Would you ask God's help? Father, right now we love you. We worship you. We know your word is true and it's forever settled in heaven. But Father, I'm asking that you would allow it to be settled in us today. I'm asking that you would loose my tongue to speak as an oracle of the Lord, allowing your living word to preach your written word. Father, we bind every hindering spirit, whether human or demonic, and we ask your perfect will be done in every heart in this house. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated if you so desire. Amen. See, the children of God, Israel by name, they had spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And because of their unbelief, they settled for less than what God wanted them to have. But after all the wandering in the wilderness, seemingly going in circles and ultimately going nowhere, there was a generation that raised up and they said, we want everything that God has to offer us. We want to experience all that there is to experience in God. They were not willing to just wander through their lives just doing without what God had sacrificed to give them. So they rose up and said, we're going to go into the promised land like Pastor was talking. We're not just going to keep going in circles around this mountain. We're going to go into the promises of God and we are going to live there and we are going to experience everything that God has for us to experience. But there were three, there was 12 tribes in Israel. But there was two and a half tribes that their inheritance or their lot fell outside of the promised land. And they, they said, well, this is enough for us. It, it, there's enough water. There's enough grass for our, for our cattle. And we'll just stop here on, on the wrong side of Jordan. And they, 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 they were able to do that because Moses said to them, you can, you can settle for this side of Jordan, you, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, but you have to go and fight with your brethren because sometimes you've got to fight for the promises of God. You can't just walk into the promised land. You've got to make up your mind that whatever it takes to have what God wants for me to have, I'm willing with a made up mind. But watch. Here was the only requirement for them to be able to settle on that side of Jordan. He said, you've got to go and fight with your brethren until they get their inheritance. And they went and fought alongside of their brothers. And they went with them conquering 31 kings and 31 cities in the promised land. But after all the fighting and all the faithfulness, Joshua comes to them and says, you've done everything God's asked of you. 31 kings, 31 cities. And said to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, you can go back to the other side of Jordan and enjoy what you've settled for. But as they were willing to go and settle for less than what they had faithfully fought for, they began to make their journey back to the other side of Jordan, outside of the promised land. But as they were willing to settle for less than what they have so faithfully fought for, they began to fear for their next generation. That their next generation, their children to come, would not know the same God that brought 
brought them out of Egypt and through the wilderness and into the promised land. They began to fear that they would not know, their children would not know, nor be able to experience the God who had answered by fire in the wilderness through the tabernacle plan, which was God's plan for man to approach Him. Hear me. It was the, the these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe, Manasseh, they said, well, we've got to do something lest our generation to come don't know the God that brought us out and took us through and brought us into the promised land. So the Bible said that they began to build an altar. And building this altar. Now, now let me just give you a little Bible study. The altar in the Old Testament was the first piece of furniture in the plan of God, the tabernacle plan. That was how man approached God. And the altar was the first piece. And God said, I want you to make it so tall, so wide, with so much uh, dimension. I want you to make it just like this. And God gave them a pattern. But what they would do was, at that altar, they would come and they would offer sacrifice. And when they put that sacrifice, maybe a bull or a turtle dove, whatever it was they would put that, that sacrifice on there and the fire of God would show up and answer by fire. Fire would fall from heaven, consume the sacrifice and it was at the altar that you initiated a relationship with the God of creation. It was at the altar where they would lay their sacrifice and after they had given that sacrifice, God would come and answer by fire fire and initiate a relationship with man at the altar. And so what they said was, here's what we've got to do to connect our generations to come with the God of the gener the God of uh, that brought us out of Egypt. We've got to create an altar. And so they built an altar. They made it the same height. They made it the same width. The same dimensions. And the other tribes, they got upset. And said, you can't build an altar to go sacrifice to all these other gods. And they said, no. Ed? He's not that kind of altar. He's just the pattern. A replica of the real thing. It's just the right dimensions. It's the right measurements. And, but Ed, he's not for burnt offering. He's not for sacrifice. He's just there for show. He's just there for looks. And they were willing to trust their next generation's salvation. Not on experience, but on just simply giving them a pattern that had no power. To give them the, 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 the right details, but no demonstration of the spirit and power of God. They were willing to give them the exactness without the experience. See, they were willing to give them the, 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 the knowledge of the altar, but not the experience of the God that would meet them at the altar. Now, and that's what they were. But I'm not willing to trust my next generation, my children, or the people of this world. I'm not just going to try to hand them the pattern that has no power accompanying it. See, Christianity is not just some college curriculum that you can check all the boxes and you can make all the details but have no demonstration of the power of God. See, what we preach here is not just a pattern that's a replica of the real but this is that I'm telling you the altar that we have here is an altar that knows fire this is more than just a bible study in a bag this is more than just a college curriculum a mental ascent or knowledge to be understood but this is more than an altar called Ed an experiential knowledge that when God you put your sacrifice he will answer by fire now sit down you got to go to preach me to death okay but you have to understand what we believe in this Christianity it's more than just a dogma without demonstration of God's power this is more than just a pattern it's more than just measurements without a manifestation but when the people raised up and said you can't build an altar a replica just like the real altar you can't do that 
and just give your children? That, that, that doesn't work. So they said, you can't do that. And they said, well, no, Ed, he's not that kind of altar. He's not for burnt offering. He's not for sacrifice. See, what we believe and our feeling and our experiencing here is more than just an altar called head, uh, or head, Ed. <laughs> It's more than just an altar call head. I remember because I, I dropped out of high school because I started partying and drugs and relationships and all this kind of just pulled me away from my high, high school football career and all this stuff, you know, because back in the day we all got those stories. Back in the day I could throw a football over those mountains. <laughs> But listen, I literally was losing, I was falling out of, of high school, dropped out, mom smacked me around, made me go back and do day school and night school just so I can pass on time. But here's the thing, I barely passed high school. But when I became a preacher, I had this, this, this church got a hold of me and they wanted me to come and they wanted me to preach a youth week and they wanted me to come and sit with the students at the high school and they were trying to really reach their high school and have an influence in their city and they began to uh, kind of ask the principal can we come in can we have a pre the, the principal was no absolutely not you can't bring your bibles we're not going to have no you can't have your preacher come in nothing and kind of shut the doors but there was a little 13 year old girl that refused to take no for an answer and she began to pray and she began to fast and believe that God was going to help her reach her school. A 13-year-old girl praying and fasting. But here's the thing. The, the, the principal said no. But when she began to pray and fast, the teachers, three eighth grade civil, uh, civil so, social studies came together, three teachers, and they said, we heard that the principal won't let your preacher come and eat lunch with the students, but maybe we can bring our classes together, and we're teaching on the three major leading religions of the world, and we've already taught on Islam, we've already taught on Judaism, now we're in our branch of Christendom. I want to know if you can bring your preacher in to teach all three of our classes about your particular brand of Christianity. See, what we believe is more than just a pattern. Because when I went in there and they said, well, what makes your particular branch of Christianity different than all the other denominations? And I couldn't help myself but start out, Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. That's Hebrew for Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The fact that we believe that there's one God and His name is Jesus because Jesus is the Father in flesh. That's where it started. And they said, well, okay. And I kept on going. They kept on asking questions and I kept on giving answers. And all of a sudden, they, when they asked questions, it's like it was an encyclopedia. All the stuff just started coming out of me that I didn't know was there. They started saying, because there is, I, listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It is Jehovah, it, Jehovah of the old stepped into flesh and became Jesus the Father in flesh. That's who Jesus is. And I said Jesus is not a third part of a fictitious trinity that does not exist. I said there is one God and Jesus according to Hebrews 1 and 3 is the express image of his person, his singular person. It did not say that he is a third part of three persons. It said that Jesus was the express image of that one singular person. I'm telling that's what I said in fact here's where the encyclopedia came out I said in fact there was not even talk of a trinity until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea where they had much influence from the Roman Emperor Constantine who had been recently converted to Christianity. Now Constantine, being he was a Christian now but he was still a politician. So an attempt to please all of the people. <laughs> An attempt to please all the people. He, he said, okay, we've got polytheism, which is the belief in many gods, and you've got a lot of Jews and Christians that believe monotheism, that there's just one God. So he married the idea of paganism and the fact that there's one God, polytheism with monotheism, and he said, let's just give them one God in three persons.
pagans and that will appease the pagans and that will appease those that are monotheistic and they married the idea through that Roman emperor's influence and gave the doctrine of the Trinity 300 years removed from the upper room experience at Pentecost. I'm telling you, once I went through all that, I looked back in the back and one of the teachers of that 8th grade class was back there. She is crying. I walked back to her. I said, why are you crying? She said, because I grew up and I was confirmed Catholic and I knew nothing of the history, but I believe that there is something in what you are saying. So she said, Ryan, can I come to your revival service? And she came and she sat on the back pew and y'all began to worship, scared her half to death. But at the end of that service, I started climbing pews and I got back to where she was. And I, I said, just lift your hands. And she lifted her hands and God filled that teacher with the Holy Ghost. And she began to speak with other tongues. This is more than just a pattern. This is more than just a college curriculum. This is an altar that knows fire. I didn't come here to beat Ed. I came here to meet Jesus Christ. I came here to know the God that answers. Once that teacher got the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues, not just knowing the history, but knowing the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it, it opened the whole school district up. That's the difference. It's more than just a pattern that hope you, you give your children just the, the pattern and the, the doctrine, but the doctrine without demonstration. Leave something to be desired. But hear me. They said about Ed, he's not for burnt offering. He's not for sacrifice. But if there's not sacrifice, then there's not fire. And if there's not fire, there's no changing agent in the plan of God. But Hebrews 12 and 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire, not has a consuming fire, but is a consuming fire. Because if there's no sacrifice, there's no fire. And fire in its nature. You know, the nature of fire is to change the nature of everything else that it touches. And it's not saying God has fire. It says God is fire. Because in God's nature, you cannot be touched by God and remain the same. Because in His nature, in His nature is to change the nature of everything that He touches. And if there's no sacrifice, there is no fire. And if there is no fire, there is no true lasting change. fire shows up it changes things whether you want it to or not my wife's from Colorado and now every once in a while they get some fires passing through there and they start coming down those mountains that fire starts creeping down that mountain and people lose their homes but when fire shows up it changes things they don't want their house to burn down but when fire shows up it changes things I was in one service and there was a family there, a little uh, seven-year-old boy they had that was on the back pew. And he was there asleep. Mom and dad, they came up to the altar. And while he slept back there, that little seven-year-old boy, he had autism. And such a severe case of autism, he had never been able to look his mother in the eyes. Never been able to communicate to them, I love you, uh, or any type of emotion. But he's there on the back pew. 
And mom and dad, they come up here hand in hand like I saw some of you praying one another. Hand in hand. They're up here and they got their hands lifted. And they begin to offer to God the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of my lips giving thanks to God. And as they're worshiping, I'm telling you, the fire of God failed in that service. And when it did, mom, all of a sudden, something hit mom. She said, I got to go check my baby. And she started running back to where mom was and or back to where her baby was. And that little baby, before she got there, he sat up in the pew and looked mom right in the eyes and said, mom, a man came to me in my dream and told me everything's going to be okay. I'm here to tell you when the fire shows up, it can change anything. It can change all the, it doesn't matter what situation, but the fire fire. It can do a miracle. It can change the nature of your situation. It can break you out of addiction like it broke out. When the fire falls, it changes things. Goodness. Because we were in another revival. I just got back last weekend preaching at the same church. About eight years ago, seven years ago, I was preaching at the same church I was at last weekend. And there was a family there. They had a week-long revival. They were doing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm telling you, there was a family there, a mom and a daughter that were there every night. But the dad, he didn't like the church because they spoke with tongues. And he thought talking in tongues was phony. So he was mad at the preacher. Didn't like what he was preaching to his wife and his daughter. But they came every night of the revival. And that last night, dad threw a fit. He said, all right, if you go to that church tonight, that service tonight, he said, I'm done. We're through. We're over. I want a divorce. It's that real. <laughs> he said, Mama, you got to make up your mind. She said, we're done. I want a divorce. And she, watch what she said. She said, all right. She said, you can leave me if you want. But you're not taking my minivan. <laughs> God honest truth. That's how they told, told it to me. She, she said, you can leave me, but you're not taking my minivan. Okay. And she said back to him, said, and I love you. And you're not taking my minivan, but if you want me to drive you somewhere, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. He said, fine. Threw the keys at her. She got, he got in the car. Going to have her drive him somewhere. She locked the door. She drove that joker all the way to the church Somehow convinced him to come into the church that night And he was, listen, he was sitting in the church He was sitting in the church, he looked mad as a hornet I'm telling you, I was scared to death Because he looked mad at me Because I was the one with the mic I'm the one that had been preaching about all this stuff And now he don't even know me but he's, he's a big old boy. And he's mad at me. And I have done nothing wrong. But in the end of that service, I'm here to tell you, I said, I just simply said this. I said, if there's anybody that wants to just come to this altar and fall on your face before God, you can come to this altar right now. And my son, about two years old, gets up and just comes to the front and just lays on the floor. <laughs> Nobody moved. It was so tense because they knew the situation going on with him. Nobody moved but my son. And when my son fell on his face, I don't know, just doing what he saw dad do, I guess. But when he fell on his face, I'm telling you, the spirit of God began to move. The fire began to fall. And that, that gentleman, he stood up. And I thought he was either going to run out or charge me. But he stood up just long enough to fall to his knees and threw his hands up in the air. And God filled him. See all the counselors 
God. My God. I'll move on. I gotta move on. Because if there's no sacrifice, there's no fire. If there's no fire, see this is the thing cool about fire. Did you know the same chemical reaction that causes something to ignite in a flame of fire? Oxidization? It's the same chemical reaction that causes something to rust. So you get to make the decision today. Either you're going to allow God to change something in you. In your marriage, in your home, in your struggle, in your addiction, in, 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 in the country. You can, you can either cause it to ignite a flame of fire of change. Or you can just begin to slowly deteriorate and rust. But we need a church that's on fire. Leave the rest for everybody else. We're going to have fire in Laranja. And then would you clap your hands right now? Because that family, that family that I told you all about, that family is now one of the pillars of that church. And their kids are both in Bible college there in St. Paul, Minnesota. Hear me, somebody. I'm telling you, just one move of God, just one laying on the altar, one sacrifice can change everything, all things. But now, here's the thing. Where there is no sacrifice, there is no fire. But to have fire, you've got to have sacrifice. They said about Ed, they said, no, 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 no. Ed, he'll never know fire. Because he will never have sacrifice. But here's the thing. What sacrifice look like? Sacrifice looks like Keith. Keith was a 30-year-old man, tatted up, sleeves on both sides. He had gauges in his ears. I think that's what they call them, gauges. You, he had big old gauges. You can stick your finger through them if you're into that sort of thing. Built-in cup holders, I called him. <laughs> hey, here, hold my drink. And I... Right? But Keith, he came into one of our services. He didn't know nothing about God. He was the farthest thing away from God. But he came into our service. And you know what happened? He came. And he gave himself to God on that altar. And I'm telling you, something happened to Keith. And God began to move on Keith. And we never said anything. We, we, we loved him just like he was. We just said, you just let God. You just fall in love with God. And you just give yourself completely to God. And God will just do a work in your life. And I'm telling you, we just loved Keith. And Keith just fell in love with God. But Keith told us the story. And you go find Keith on my Facebook right now. He prays through every time that we do some kind of Facebook Live. Keith is amazing. But Keith came and he came, got a hold of God, and he just fell in love with God. But Keith one night was working at, in the middle of Walmart overnight. Anybody ever been to Walmart? In the middle of the night? Wow, this is getting rough. Somebody works in Walmart. <laughs> but Keith, that's a show in itself. Just go to Walmart in the middle of the night. Uh, you never know what you're going to see in the middle of Walmart. But there was Keith. And as he said, he said, I was in the middle of, I was stocking shelves. Hear me, somebody. Keith was stocking shelves. And as he's putting things on the shelf, he said he felt like God whispered to him. He said, would you give me those? Talking about his, his gauges. And he said, if you want them. And he said, I felt like God said, if you give those to me, I'll do a miracle. Wow. Wow. So Keith, in the middle of Walmart, yeah. took those out of his ears and said, God, if you want them, here they are. And he held them up to God. And he began to weep and cry. And when he held them up to God like a sacrifice, literally in that moment, he said, I felt God so strong. But what God did in the middle of Walmart, that miracle that he spoke of, automatically those, those ears scabbed over and closed shut. And to this day, you can't even tell that he's ever here. Hey, I've got a little earring that I 
pierced myself. It was I messed it up. It got infected. You can still tell that it's there. But hear me. You go to look at Keith. There was a sacrifice made. And the fire fell in the middle of Walmart. And I'm telling you, you can't even tell to this day. And you know what? God did a miracle for Keith. Because Keith, he pulled those out of his ears. He pulled it out of his heart. And that's what sacrifice He's not after your ears. He's after your heart. Because he wants you. Oh, come on, somebody clap your hands under God. We're about to have a move of God. And God's about to do miracles in somebody's life. Now, here's the thing. I'm almost done. You might want to get ready just in case. Just be standing there. And then I'll give you the nod. Then start playing. Because some of y'all just went, thank God he's almost done. Not yet. Because we've got we've to make sure we know who Ed really is. Because without sacrifice, there is no fire. But here's the thing. When I say sacrifice, everybody has some kind of concept of sacrifice. And most of the time, our concept of sacrifice, we've got to give our stuff. And so what sacrifice looks like to us, the Holy Ghost starts moving. You want to give God everything. And when you think everything, you think, my stuff. So you come to an altar just like this and you start emptying your pockets and you start where's my wallet? I've got to give, I've got to give in the offering too. Where's my phone? I've got, to, I've got to give my contacts and my music and my movies. I've got to give those too. And we, and we empty. Wait a minute. i give, give this too. And we put, we put all the stuff on the altar. And we equate sacrifice with stuff. No more. And what happens is we put our stuff on the altar and we empty our pockets and then the fire falls and it changes the stuff. But we leave the same way that we came in. And we leave still with the same questions that are going unanswered. We leave feeling isolated, alone. Nobody knows what we're going through or what we're struggling with. And we leave feeling empty. We leave feeling undone. Like there's something more. Because our idea of sacrifice in a Western culture has become about our stuff and just giving our money and just giving our clothes and just giving all of the stuff. And we've got empty pockets. So what happens next service? You come and you feel like God wants more and you've emptied yourself in your pockets and you're frustrated in your faith because you've given everything you know to give but still nothing has changed in me still nothing has changed in us because we've given our stuff but what God is saying is this is not the sacrifice he's looking for I'll show you what sacrifice he's looking for this is the sacrifice he's looking for go ahead and sit down on that altar that's what he wants he wants you because if he has you, he has the stuff. He's after your heart. He's after you. Because here's the, here's the real fact of the matter is the reason why, hear me somebody, the reason why we give our stuff instead of ourselves is because we feel like the stuff's more valuable. I'm telling you the most valuable thing in this house to God. It's not the money you can give. It's not the stuff you have to offer. It's you. So this is a church that has given so very much. But the last thing that he wants is not your stuff. 
but he wants you to experience him. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to a lady that I know here in a second. Her name's Cassandra. You can bring the picture up. I'm going to show you Cassandra. Now, Cassandra, if you can see that, I don't know if you can see that real well. Cassandra is the one in the orange. She's married to my one of the young men that I won to the Lord and discipled, and now he's a minister of the gospel. But Cassandra, she, she came to church and she knew the pattern. She knew about church and about God, but she had never truly experienced Him. She rode the Sunday school bus and she would go every Sunday and know all the Sunday school songs. She knew the stories, Daniel and the lion's den. She knew Noah and the ark. She knew all of that. But that when she got to about 13 years old, she knew the pattern. She knew the exactness of the altar but had never truly experienced God. And she began to go to youth camps and youth events and she would go and they would preach and she would feel like she wants to just go to that altar. She would go to that altar and she would give her stuff. But the problem was she went to one too many services. She'd emptied her pockets and had seemingly nothing left to give. So she began to venture around the world and have relationships and try drugs and party and just, just looking for something to kind of feel that God-shaped void. So she went out in the world. She did everything that her parents had told her to do. She followed it to the letter, but it was not working for her. So she decided one day, about 20 years old, she decide, decided that she was going to sit at the table at her mom and dad's house that had taught her, that had showed her the pattern, that had laid out the measurements, the rights, the wrongs, the do's, the don'ts. But she decided to write them a letter and it went something like this. I'm paraphrasing. But mom and dad, I'm so sorry. I've done everything that you've asked me to do. It's not working. I've worshipped and prayed. I gave everything you asked me to give. So because it didn't work, I decided to take my life today. Cassandra had made it up in her mind that it wasn't worth it because all she'd ever known was an altar called Ed. And she'd given her stuff, but it seemingly wasn't enough. Because the stuff wasn't what God wanted. He wanted Cassandra's heart. By the grace of God, somehow God intervened and she made her way back to an altar. And instead of giving her stuff, she said, God, it may not be much. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to try. And she, she literally bowed her knee at that altar and said, God, it may not be worth much, but here I am. And the fire fell and God touched Cassandra that day. God filled her with the gift of His Spirit that day. But now look, Cassandra, a preacher's wife. But she was in the church that I came out of and my wife's dearest friend, but she worked at a nursing home overnight. And Cassandra had a heart for the elderly. So she worked there for years. But one night after that encounter, after that encounter, she went into the nursing home. Sister Jenkins, she went into the nursing home and she woke up a lady who was going to give her her medication that she had to have periodically through the night, walked in, knocked and said, excuse me, ma'am, are you ready for your medication? That lady opened her eyes and seen Cassandra and started to crawl back up in her bed and said, fire! Fire! The nurses cleared the station and they came running because they were trying to figure out where the fire was. And they came in the room. Cassandra tried to calm them down. There's no fire. There's nothing going on. And they, okay, they went back to their stations. Cassandra went back in there to give the medication. The lady laid eyes on her one more time and began to scream, Fire! 
fire. The nurses cleared the stations once again. They came. They relieved Cassandra of that room. And they began to apply the medicine. She went on to the next room where there was a man that was already awakened by the screams. And she tried to immediately begin to console him and say, I'm so sorry, sir. There's no fire. There's nothing. He said, yes, there is. He said, there is a fire. And it's on you. And he said, you got the Holy Ghost, don't you? If you could only see all of your prayers and all of your fasting this week. If you can see what is truly in this house waiting to fall on you. If you would just but lift your hands and say, God, I've done everything that I know to do. I tried religion and it didn't work. I did what mom and dad told me to do, but I'm still empty. I'm still undone. Somebody, he doesn't want your stuff. He wants you because you're the most valuable thing in this world. Thank you. So God is asking somebody right now that you've given before and seemingly it didn't fulfill that need in you. I'm here to tell you there's fire in this house and God is calling you. Come give me your heart. Come to this altar and give me your heart. Somebody stand to your feet. Would you do it all over this house? Somebody is going to have an experience with God. It might as well be you. Somebody is going to experience God like never before. And He is going to break the chains of addiction. He is going to solve the riddle that you found str you're found struggling with. Are you ready? The fire is about to fall. So I'm asking somebody right now, I want you to grab a hold of your neighbor's hand, your wife, your children, your family, and I want you to come to this altar and I want you to make the sacrifice of praise and I want you to bring your heart and I want you to know you're more valuable than you realize. I want you to bring everything you have. Come on. Come on now. Come on, with all honesty and sincerity, please come. Get as close as you can to this altar. And we're going to pray. And we're going to watch God meet your need. We're going to watch God bring fire down in this house. Come on, is there anybody in here you've done everything that you know to do? But all that you really need, come on, keep coming forward. There's people that need to get in this altar. Get as close as you can to this altar. Come on, thank you for being honest. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for, because there's another Cassandra in this house. There's somebody that you tried and it didn't work. Come on, keep filling in. Somebody keep filling in. We got a lot on the left that are coming in. Come on, keep moving over to the right. Come on, you're not too far gone. You're not too far gone. You couldn't fail enough. You couldn't make enough mistakes. There's a God in heaven that loves you enough. Right now. Come on, I want you to bow your head right now with all honesty. And I want you to ask God to forgive you. I want you to be good. Say, God, I'm sorry. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of being confused. I'm tired of wondering what we're going to do next. I'm sorry. Come on, use your voice. Just be honest with God. I'm sorry. I'm tired of running. Forgive me for all of my sins. I'm sorry that I didn't give you my heart. I know you want more than my money. I know you want more than what I have to offer. Are you ready? Now everybody's going to be praying for somebody. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands and I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. And when you lift your hands as a sacrifice of praise unto God, that God that answers by fire is going to come and He's going to break the chains of depression. 
He's going to cancel out your insecurities. He's going to cancel out your fears. Are you ready to be healed? Are you ready to be changed? I want everybody to lift your hands now. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray let the fire of God fall in the name of Jesus. That's it. Let your voice out. If you've not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let your voice out. Let your voice out. I'm receiving the Holy Spirit.